Well, we have survived another weekend of self-isolation and social distancing, but one soccer's player punted hangouts, well, they are back. And today, our special guest, he is one of the key pieces of Cavalry FC and also owns 50 Canadian caps to his name, Nick Ledgerwood. Welcome to the program from Calgary. Nick, how are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm holding on, surviving as much as I can, I guess. Good stuff. Good stuff. I mean, it's it's been a wild, wild couple weeks. Almost like we're almost into week number four, and with no real sign of things to change drastically anytime soon. What are some of the things that you've been doing with your teammates um, in terms of keeping in contact and just personally keeping mentally and as physically fit as possible? Yeah, I think that's the I think that's the biggest hurdle right now is just the unknown of when when is this going to pass? When can we get back to normality and, and get back trained with the guys but you know until then uh we've, we've been doing some good work through groups on zoom or uh you know just some some smaller group work uh tactical type stuff that you know to make sure that we're all on the same page once this does kick off and then as far as trying to stay in shape you know everybody's got their makeshift gyms in their basement now or you know in their living room trying to trying to stay fit we get programs sent to us every day so just, just the little things to try and keep fit and, and take over, um, especially here in Calgary when they're still right. run. I've also, I've also been doing my own little work. My family around with my wife, 20 minute workouts called, I think they're called Quarant Lean on, uh, on YouTube. So I'm staying fit. Yesterday was an upper body. So slow push-ups, you know, that kind of stuff, some plain cold. So I'm with you, Nick, wake up 10 coffees, 20 minute Quarant Lean. Then I get into the beers. <laughs> well, that, that sounds like your weekend. I hope that's not your Monday to Friday because you're leading like four of our meetings a day. That would answer some questions though. Hey, hey, no, it's, it's Monday to Friday. It's seven days, seven days a week. Then you have one day off and you get into the next program. So fair enough. I mean, has, everyone, has everyone figured out their weekday quarantine program more or less now? Like, is there any bit more of a routine? Like, have you been able to discover what's working for you and what's getting you through the days? Guess we'll start with Ollie. We haven't heard from him yet. Also, tell um, us about this hockey jersey behind you. I, That's new. Thank God. Oh, this. Thank God that York Nine yeah. jersey's gone. Yeah, it nothing me. against nothing against York Nine, but like it's just it's been too much. Like, so the only CPO jersey I have is a York Nine one because I bought the one I thought was nicest last year, and Kurt's been harping on about it for for weeks now. Let's go change it up. <laughs> so, uh, I've got the old University ice hockey jersey out here. University of East Anglia is the top program for, for hockey, as I'm sure you're all aware. <laughs> yeah. Everyone knows if you, everyone everyone knows first of all if you call it ice hockey, then you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> um, if you if you're aware of the website Elite Prospects, you can actually find me on there. Um, did not get recruit did not get recruited in the end, but you know. Prospects, you you still got the hope of making it then, or what? <laughs> I'm I'm holding out hope. But I think what's holding me back is I have my player profile but then I also for some reason have a goaltender profile and despite never playing in net for, for this team I have a goals you, against average of 24. Right. Confusing the scouts then they so, don't know yeah, if they yeah. should put that's, you in between the pipes or up front fair enough. That's really hard. Okay to Ollie what are you doing Monday to Friday to sort of keep some normalcy here? Um, I don't do much I wake up <laughs> I do some work I do this I do some more work and then I like read my book or something for a few hours that's that's about it. <laughs> And Kurt, how many meetings are you holding a day? I'm going to say at least six. Well, a lot of the meetings are productive, but then as, as you know, Adam, some of our meetings are just us kind of getting on and acting like we're having a meeting when really we're just kind of bored or coming up with uh, crazy content ideas, some of which will be rolled out later this week. But uh, my days are pretty established now. Uh, get up, make the wife some breakfast, uh, change the baby, because I know that she's going to have to deal with them the rest of the day and then uh, scheduled walks same thing uh get in my my lean workouts uh maybe a beer or two to, to top off the night and then i'm back into it the next day so wash rinse repeat yeah so ledger what i'm hoping that the pro athletes day is going to sound a little bit more productive then uh it's it's a struggle <laughs> you know i got i got two little ones at home as well and it's, it's a mix between parenting and and trying to to stay fit and active and 7 30 when the little one comes to wake me up uh so that's when i get going every every morning breakfast and then usually in the morning try to do the workouts so I usually get from about 9 30 till 
12, 1230, you try to do, we usually get a yoga session, a workout, and then I have a stationary bike at home, which is, which is good for cardio. So that's, that's kind of my morning. Um, and then it's just parenting the rest of the day until, until about eight o'clock till they go to bed. And then it's, uh, time for, for me and my wife to, you know, get on the couch and just relax. So looking over it. the clock, I know what you feel, man. You're looking over the clock. Is it eight <laughs> o'clock yet? Is it eight o'clock for me? It's like, is it six, six o'clock yet? Cause my, my guy is just nine months old. So yeah, it's like groundhog day though. Every day it's just <laughs> to survive and, you know, make sure there's no major accidents with the kids and that's it all right who's the who's the better homeschooler between the two of you you know it's it's funny we're not so my and i have a girl who's 18 months old not we're not quite at like we need a curriculum for them we need to right you know it's more just entertaining them um which is probably harder because you know we're <laughs> watching frozen 2 about you know every other day uh you know i'm a master at building thomas the train tracks <laughs> <laughs> fair enough fair. so but if we were to fast forward like let's go back to like public school middle school nick for a second what would be your best subject to teach the little ones and what would you just like not even attempt because it would be probably more detrimental um you know i, I was actually very strong in math math would probably okay. be yeah um and then as far as something where i would just I would just cringe to teach my kids would probably be English. Yeah. Yeah. Like going through the poetry and the proper writing techniques, all, all that stuff. Nah, just. Hey, no, fair no. enough. Fair enough, Nick. I mean, the only math that a lot of us are doing right now, when, if we don't have to be doing math is counting down the days, how long has it been since sports were canceled and how long is it going to be until sports come back Lots of things up in the air right now, Kurt, but obviously you keep yourself in the loop. You don't just call yourself the one soccer expert. You work for it too. What have you been hearing from different people around the league about when we might see soccer return? As you know, Adam, I have a lot of connections at the league, various various levels throughout. So uh, I take a lot of phone calls and I make a lot of phone calls. Uh, one of the more interesting conversations I had recently was, you know, what does this look like? You know, when the CPL comes back, a couple of my sources at the, at the league level have said um, the league might see this uh, as an opportunity if it manages to be one of the first leagues or potentially the only league that's able to, to come back, um, say, you know, mid-summer and, and, and maybe have a lot more eyeballs on it. The question is, are fans going to be interested in piling into the seats and filling the seats given what we're coming out of. And so the conversation I had is uh, someone within the league just even mentioning, you know, potentially playing behind closed doors, you know, on one soccer, you know, a lot of eyeballs would be on the channel. A lot of eyeballs would be on the league just as that relief of sports finally coming back. So I think those conversations are at least happening again, nothing set in stone, but, but for sure the league is already looking ahead to, um, you know, post June into early July, how can we make this work? Nick, how long would you need to, and by you speaking sort of on behalf of your teammates and other players around the league, how much minimum time do you think you would need for a pre feel safe and comfortable going into a new year? Uh, 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 that's a good question. Cause you know, everybody's come off of now four month off season, which is, you know, in any football standards, way too long for an off season. So we come off of a four month off season, we get back into preseason for two, three weeks. And now all of a sudden we have another possibly three months of, of being on our own, um, you know, and then just to see week preseason together and kick off the season is, you know, it's very hard to, to see that being realistic. But on the flip side, I think the teams now are being so proactive about uh, you know, at least six days a week, getting some kind of physical fitness in, you know, I know our boys are doing almost, it's, it's almost two hours a day of something physical, um, you know, mixed together with weights, yoga, cardio. So if we at least have that base going into a preseason, everybody physically fit, then you can kind of minimize the injuries that way. But, you know, to get this started, I would say a minimum of three weeks training camp uh, uh to get it started 
Ollie, is it worse for a new league like the CPL to be the first to come back but lose that gate because they're still trying to build audience? Or like Kurt mentioned, is there the opportunity to maybe showcase more events to more people if they come back a little earlier and are one of the first outlets or leagues to get? Yeah, it's, it's, there's pros and cons, right? Like I, I would struggle to say that it would be a good thing for the league for, for all of this to happen and for us to potentially be playing behind closed doors. Um, but, you know, it would be interesting to see. We've seen it a little bit in, in Belarus, as irresponsible as they've been. Um, they've suddenly got a lot more eyeballs than normal on, on their league just through people, A, wanting to watch some soccer, B, wanting something to gamble on, you know, all these different reasons with why, why people tune in, right? So um, that could, I guess, be, be an opportunity there. Um, but, yeah, it would be a shame to see empty stadiums, particularly for a league that's trying to build fan bases and, and communities around these clubs right now. And Curtis, it's safe to say that the CPL in a way is at an advantage because there's fewer clubs and there's no international travel for the most part. Everything can stay within Canada versus like an MLS or, or European continent where there's so much travel in and out of countries like that. Well, as I mentioned on last week's show, I mean, this is also a league where charter flights aren't involved, right? So you're also, you know, you're going through airports with everybody else. As, as, as Nick knows, uh, you're sitting on, on, on airplanes uh, with everybody else, as as Nick knows, so I don't think there's any there's no, there's no benefit to to being in a in a in a contained league as far as that goes. Fair enough. Okay, um, so that's the latest on when we might see some football. And the reality is, with cities like Calgary, just on behalf of having Nick here and Toronto as well, saying we're seeing no public gatherings till at least the end of June. Canada Day at the earliest is the latest, but it's likely going to be. It, few weeks if not a month later but we'll keep you updated with everything we hear okay nick next question for you today we're gonna lighten things up a little bit we always like to go a little bit of fun get a little bit serious and then just kind of shake it off and lighten the mood if you had to be stuck in self-isolation or social distancing with one of the three following one soccer personalities kurt larson oliver platt or gareth wheeler who would you pick? But first, we're going to let each of the two gentlemen in the chat with us right now sell you on why they are the best quarantine partner. Yeah. Ollie, who, do you want to go first on this one or do sure. you want to? Yeah, okay. um, I'll go first. I'll base my pitch around the idea of being just kind of not a positive in Nick's life, but just not a negative. So, so my pitch is basically, <laughs> I will not bother you. I will not talk to you when you don't want to be talked to. Um, you know, I do my work. I do some pretty independent stuff, read, watch TV and so on. Uh, and then I go to bed. So I, I think life with me would be incredibly boring, but it might not be actively annoying. <laughs> yeah, so I come at this from a little different angle than <laughs> Oliver Platt. See, for me, did, sorry, Adam, did you mention uh, Gareth Wheeler in this conversation as well? I did, I couldn't leave out wheels. Yeah, so I, my feeling is that Gareth, uh, we love Gareth for what he is and what he does, but he, the guy has a lot to say. <laughs> a lot to say. So Nick Ledgerwood, I think you know that you don't want to be around somebody who's going to have that much to say all the time. Uh, then it's, you know, with, with Oliver Platt, it's maybe there'd be a little bit too, too little to say. Maybe he's reading too many books. Maybe you want a little bit of more, more life and entertainment in the house. So I think what I'm bringing is that happy, that happy middle, that middle ground where uh, I'm not too quiet, not too loud. I'm also a very good uh, cook. Uh, host uh and and quite knowledgeable on a wide range of subjects even outside of soccer so i can have a sophisticated conversation about a number of different things that maybe gareth and oliver platt wouldn't be able to uh, so that's my pitch the, the happy middle the happy middle so another thing to keep in mind nick is that kurt has a young one so that would be a third child in the house <laughs> he is kidless what does my wife come does my wife boat. come too <laughs> I'm, that's a good point. You could leave. You could leave CPL with with Sinead. Yeah. That's fair. Okay. Anyways, Nick, because Kurt's such a big Love Island fan, we wanted to get this sort of bachelor feeling in. So it's time for the rose ceremony, or I guess the soccer ball. Who are you going to uh, give your ball to? Well, since Gareth's not here, I'm going to exclude him from the event. I didn't even try to sell you on it, eh? That's not uh, commitment. Uh, Gareth, you know, and and Kurt's kind of right. He he, do, he does talk a lot. And it was that kind of thing too much. Um, and, and, you know, I think I would struggle with Kurt because he, he's, he tries to be so controversial all the time. I think that he, he, just, he just says stuff to try and create an argument or, you know, you, you get it all the time on Twitter. He doesn't really believe all the stuff he writes. He just wants people to write back and argue. 
<laughs> well, I, I would struggle with that with Kurt. And so I think, I think the, uh, the CPL soccer ball is going to go to Ollie. Congratulations, you Should Kurt and I leave and you guys can plan your quarantine? That's, that's got to be the worst winning pitch of all time. <laughs> what, was, what was the last line? Not, not actively boring, it's I think. Not, is active, not actively annoying, yeah. Not actively annoying, okay. Yeah, I pride myself on that. I, I, could, I think I could get some good banter out of Ollie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I might, I I might so. have to borrow that tagline for some online dating profiles. Ollie, you're okay with that. <laughs> Okay, uh, we want to, get to um, respond to that. I don't get to respond to that, or I, I was trying to avoid any hostility, but um, you've you've punched your way through, so you might as well go. No, no, I get this. I get this all the time uh, that I rock value that I'm some kind of Stephen A. Smith of the CPL, and it's just not true. It's just I have opinions. I'm not scared to give my opinion, as other people are, as other people in in the Canadian soccer media even are. And I guess if you disagree with half those, which usually you're probably not going to agree with me more than 50% of the time, then, you know, that's, that's the approach you take is that I just say things just to say them when really I agree with about 98% of what I say. There might be 2% that I don't agree with, but 98% <laughs> I agree with. And for the record, for everyone watching, Kurt is not the Stephen A. Smith of the CPL. He's the Skip Bayless. He's a big Skip Bayless fan. So don't mix up your your hot take artists, okay? Kurt's a big Bayless guy. Well, yeah, so I'm not going to ask Nick to do it now because he's not going to be able to come up with anything because it's, it's hard to, to, to put someone on the spot. But I would just like an example of something I said that I haven't defended. But we don't yeah, have yeah. to do that today. We don't have to do that today. I think Unless you have one, Nick. I think he's probably got a few. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll save that till we till we have round table number two because I'm sure it'll we'll happen. Say, we'll save that for when you're a pundit on one soccer. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll get uh, we'll get Wheeler on next time, so maybe he can sway your vote from Ollie because I think he'll want to defend himself after this. Uh, one of your teammates, Nick Dominic Zator, he gets a lot of praise from Kurt in particular. Does he know that Kurt is basically his number one fan and takes a lot of heat online for pumping his tires all the time? Yeah. I mean, there's there's one thing that I probably shouldn't say about Zat. Uh, in the locker room, he actually has a, the, in his little locker, he actually has a small Kurt. Mm. You know, <laughs> you know, game, it's like him and Kurt kind of go through their pregame routine. So uh, I think, I think Zatz definitely knows that, that Kurt's a big fan. And likewise, I think, I think Zat thinks that, you know, Kurt, you know, is his number one fan. So. It wouldn't surprise me if uh, if that's where Kurt was going before a lot of shows. He kind of ducks out on the phone, so he's probably just calling Zator and just having a quick, you're going to be fine, don't make me look stupid, it's okay. Well, professionally speaking, uh, we had on Jeff Paulus a few weeks ago, and I sat here and, and told him why three center backs, including Dominic Zator and another Calvary defender and Mason Trafford, are better than his guy, uh, Amir Didich. Uh, I sat here and told him that. And then also, um, I think I played a role in at least Dominic Zator being called up to the national team due to the amount of times I spoke about him through the first two, three months of the season. Oliver Platt kind of agrees with me as well on that front that we gave him so much attention. I think it left Canada's national team no choice but to call him up. I don't know about that. I, I think we, <laughs> I would like to think that one soccer helps to um, highlight Canadian players perhaps more than has been the case in Marco Bustos on saying things like that um part of the reason why he came to the league was the dedicated broadcaster but i, I don't know if, if we're in john herdman's head just yet <laughs> we'll find out tomorrow night when gareth wheeler speaks with john herdman that is called i didn't say i was in i didn't no 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 i didn't say i didn't i didn't say i was in i didn't say i was in the coach's head what i what i said is i basically said what you just iterated there in, in that when you highlight somebody who deserves to be highlighted yeah, people yeah. people people will see that Maybe. No, it's fair. We're, we're only 50% joking about that. Um, <laughs> we also spoke to uh, Tommy recently, Nick, and he brought up again um, the, the whole winning the fall and winning the spring seasons, but he conceded, obviously, the Forge are the champions. But do you think that Forge are the true champions of year one of the CPL because they won a two-legged final versus the bulk of the season beforehand? Yeah, it's... It's, it's one of those where you, I think we could argue about that for, for hours. And, um, you know, that was the format of the league and that's how it was, was given. Um, you know, you, you got to give your respects where they're due. And I think, 
you know, Forge won both the final games. They, you know, there wasn't a tie or uh, a game like that where they got through. They won both of the games. And at the end of the day, we didn't score a goal in the finals. So are they the champions? You know, with the format that was was done in the first year, yeah, they were they were the champions. But I think everybody in our locker room doesn't feel that way, um, and I don't think our fans felt that way either. You know, given the the dominance that we we did throughout the whole season, um, you know, there's a, there's a part of it that you know we feel like we were the overall champions. But no, at the end of the day, you know, we don't we don't get to lift the the microwave plate. So. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that one. Uh, it's uh, uh, yeah. It's um, you know, it's the last games we really had to talk about. So let's let's go back to that final, Nick, because uh, for me, it was it was as if you 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 played your worst game on the worst night, or your, even your worst series, right? And what, why wasn't Calvary themselves in, in that that first leg? specifically was there a different feeling about the team with just too many guys not have their best night um you know i don't i don't think nico pasquati performed up to the level you know that we would expect him to escalante was a bit of a non-factor uh what happened in, in the final that that made you guys maybe not perform at, at your highest level yeah i think there was there's a lot of factors that could be do i mean this was probably the biggest game or the biggest final for a lot of players um you know on on our team and and on Forge's team as well it was a it was a big event and maybe some of the nerves played a factor into it um at the beginning of the game in Forge I think you know we took too much time to to kind of feel out the game and try and get involved and and put our stamp on the game and by that time we had already been a man down so I think uh you know, like you said, there there might have been a number of players that didn't play up to the potential that they showed throughout the whole season in that in that final game. Uh, but we also got, you know, an unlucky break with with Joel being sent off in the red card that changes the complete structure of a game when you go a man down, uh, especially that early. Um, so you know, we we would have been, I think, in a good spot if we came out of Forge with with a draw. Uh, but knowing that we were a man down for such a long period of time kind of kind of changed the whole scenario. The return leg, you know, how, how did you feel that went? Um, I know one of the keys to that game was really silencing Tristan Borges in terms of how you guys wanted to set up defensively. You guys accomplished that, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Tommy uh, credits you and, and kind of the system behind the ball for, for doing that. And you would think, you know, given Calvary and how well you guys played at home, that managing to shut down Forge's best attacking player would give you guys a really good opportunity. You missed a few good chances. Do you, is it one of those games where you figure a few of those opportunities to Don Malonga, you know, fall his way, and then, then maybe things are different? I've always argued that should have been a penalty call at the end of that game. Can you maybe talk about that? Did you see that as well? Just maybe just some thoughts on the return leg. Yeah, I think, um, you know, going into the return leg, every, everybody in the locker room had, you know, coaching staff included, we, we had a, an extremely good feeling about it because we knew, you know, all we needed was one goal to, to kind of carry it to extra time or to, to PKs. And we knew, we knew we had the ability to score goals. Um, in, in saying that, I think we did everything defensively that we wanted to do. Uh, it was just that little extra magical creative moment offensively that we didn't create. Um, and I think Malanga had, you know, there was, there was two or three opportunity, half opportunities. I wouldn't say they were, uh, you know, great one was a full opportunity. One was a full opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. The header in, in the second half. Um, yeah. And I think, I think on any other day, Dom, Dom puts that in the back of the net and it's one of those games, right? You know, uh, we, we struggled, you know, breaking down their back line. And, you know, I think when, when Forge added David Edgar to that back line, it added a, a different element to it that maybe we struggled breaking down. He's, uh, you know, he's a very good defender. He's a very good communicator. He can organize the back line and the midfield very well. 
um, I've known him for many years. And I think that might have been the difference between the Forge earlier on in the season, um, that they now had that experience in the back line. Um, but yeah, like, like you said, at, at the very end of the game, was it a penalty? Wasn't it a penalty? I think it was. I mean, and you can see by my reaction that I think it was. Oliver Platt doesn't think it was. Oliver, explain uh, no, yourself. I, I, didn't, I didn't say that it wasn't. I said you it know, was. I, just, I, I think it's one of those. The, the argument is if that happens in the middle of the field, I think the ref blows his whistle and he gives a free kick. But it happened yeah. in the box and it happened the last minute of the game. So he doesn't do it. You know, um, you can't because, kick some. You can't kick somebody in the shins when the ball is not there. Yeah. You know, and I, it's, it's one of those things, uh, you know, we should have scored before, uh, but we didn't. So, you know, it's on us that, uh, you know, you end up losing one nothing on a, on a break at the last minute or the last kick of the game, which is kind of bitter. But. It's, it's definitely a big what if, though, because from the neutral, unbiased broadcast perspective, stoppage time drama into PKs to decide the final or the first final of the CPL. I think that would have been juicy. Uh, we'll take, we'll take your questions as well. Uh, get them in on Twitter and in the YouTube live. We have one from Blake in the chat. He's a big Hammerby fan and he wants to know what it was like playing for Hammerby. I almost, I mean, didn't mean to make you almost do a spit take Nick, but um, I guess that was maybe a little unexpected. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. Uh, you know what? Hammerby, and for people that don't know, is in, in Stockholm and probably one of the biggest clubs in Sweden. Uh, I had an amazing time there. And it kind of came the, organically that I went there. Greg Bearhalter was the coach at the time, who's now the American coach. And I played together with him at 1860 Munich. And, you know, the season was over in Germany. It was the summer. And he had got his coaching gig, his first coaching gig in, in Stockholm with Hammerby. And... It asked if I wanted to come join and come check out the city and the state involved with it. And I went over there for a three day trip just to kind of see things. And the city was absolutely unbelievable. The people were, were very Canadian like in, in how nice they were, but it still had that European passion towards, towards football. And I was lucky enough that I played in the last year at their old stadium and then I played in the first year of their new stadium that they had, they had built. And, you know, it was a great little stadium. And the fans there were unbelievable. Like, I, I, I can't imagine, you know, better fans in, in a city like that anywhere else. Uh, you know, we, all our home games packed. 35,000 people would march to the games all the time. They have this march that they do at the beginning of the season where, you know, almost all 35,000 fans march from downtown Stockholm to the stadium on, on the first game day. It's unbelievable. And uh, I just had a real enjoyable time there. Fans, players, everything, city. So. Blake really liked that answer, by the way. He, he put in what I'm told is the club's motto, but my Swedish is non-existent. So I'm not going to attempt to butcher that, but uh, I'm sure Blake appreciates that response. Where does Stockholm hey, rank among cities you've, you've played in or not played in, but visited period. Cause I've heard great things about Stockholm too. I think uh, for me, Stockholm would be one of the only other cities that I would move to and, and want to raise a family or I could see myself living there. Um, you know, it, it'd probably be Stockholm, Munich could be in there as well, but anywhere outside of Canada would probably just be Stockholm. It, it was absolutely unbelievable. Um, you know, if you ever get a chance to go there in the spring and the summer, it's, it's a phenomenal city. It's a big stage. What do you, uh, Go ahead. Yeah, Les, what do we, well, just because you mentioned him, you know, Greg Berhalter, he's on, under a bit of heat down in the U.S. just for, for um, having up and down results with the U.S. team. Just can, mm -hmm. can you take us inside his brain as much as possible and, you know, how he operates and what do you think of what he's trying to do with the Americans right now and, and, and play a certain way in a certain style and stick to it and play out of the back? Uh, can you just give us a few comments on, on Greg Berhalter and yeah, what you know of him? Uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a good relationship with Greg when we were playing. And he was, um, he always believed in his ideas. And it was, it was his idea or, you know, his way or no way. Like he was very stuck to his principles. And even in his first coaching job, he, he micromanaged a lot. And he wanted to make sure if, if there was a mistake made, it was on him, not somebody else um and he was a perfectionist in what he did he spent all hours of the day 
you know, in the office and trying to make a perfect formation or training session or training week. So he's, he's a perfectionist in what he does. Um, in, in saying that maybe he overdoes it, overthinks it. Um, and I don't know if a lot of players buy into it early on. Um, and, you know, I think being the American coach, you have a, you have a massive pool of players to, to pull from. And if you want to get the whole team on the same page to buy into, you know, you might struggle with it a little bit, especially, you know, bigger players that are playing in Europe that have, you know, uh, a strong tactical background playing in Germany or England. And, and now all of a sudden you got to go play for the men's national team. And it's, you know, a different tactical structure, a different uh, way of playing altogether. So he might struggle with, with bigger names and, and getting everybody to, to follow what he wants to do or how he wants to coach. Don't you need more? Don't you need more tactical flexibility as an international coach than to have a way to have a style of play to how to have, you know, a way you want to go about every single game? It seems like, um, you know, the U.S. has gotten into trouble doing that. Even Canada at times has, um, you know, gotten into trouble going down to the U.S. and and, and maybe rolling out. Uh, a tactical setup that didn't go to that didn't work or wasn't suited for that game so just given what you've just said about Greg Berhalter at the international level don't you need some tactical flexibility just given all the environments you have to go play in I think so 100% um, uh, especially you know in, in CONCACAF if you're playing at home in Canada and you're playing away in in Central America I think they're two different beasts and I think being able to have that tactical flexibility where even halfway through a game or midway through through a half you could you could change something tactically and and at least have all your players understand and um you know do that in the, in the middle of a game and not have to do it over weeks of training is is what i think the modern football is all about you see you see teams like you know liverpool man city changing their formations during games and i think you know, we even with our players, we have we have a lot of cerebral players that are very smart uh, tactically, and that all stems from from our coaching staff on how they they you know coach and how we teach and how we do some video stuff. That it's not just one system, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yeah, mm-hmm. I like your guys' three back system the best. <laughs> Ollie, anything to add on that before we move on? Uh, no, that was the same question I was going to ask. Um, I, I guess while we're kind of on national team, one debate that we've been having a little bit on here has been, I kind of think that Canada have got enough quality now that they shouldn't be worried about going away to Panama and Guatemala and, and nations like that. Kurt is still more skeptical because he's been to those places and maybe knows a bit more about them than I do. Um, as a player, h- how much does that affect you? How tough was, was that to go to those places? Yeah, if if you're not used to it, yeah. like like Kurt said, you can't explain it unless you've been there. And mm-hmm. you know, we had some of our World Cup qualifying that we were in Panama and Honduras. There's stories that you can't, you know, you tell people, and they were like, "Oh yeah, that must have been loud," and you probably didn't get much. Food. But we had, you know, night before a game in Panama, we had fireworks being shot at our hotel building. You know, they set up they set up a full street carnival at two o'clock in the morning and the cops just stand there and they don't do anything about it. They just I was also I was also outside in the party. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you saw me out the window, but I was actually out there as well. <laughs> well car, cars were stopping setting up their big speakers and shooting fireworks, and that's two o'clock in the morning and you gotta kick off a game the next day. Um, you know, same with, with Honduras. The atmosphere there was so loud that you can even you can even talk to somebody playing next to you. The Leisurewood doesn't it does it always just seems to me too. I mean, I remember that I think we're talking about the same game in Panama in 2012. It just seems like when teams from Central America or even some you know quality sides in the Caribbean, the Jamaicas, the Trinidads, it also just seems like their players rise to a different level in those moments because yeah. there's an expectation. I mean Panama at BMO Field, where you guys won 1-0 on that goal from Di Rosario during that World Cup qualifying cycle, versus Panama and Panama City. It's two different teams. I don't, I, and it's, it's hard to explain. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, they might say the same with us, you know, they might say us at home is a different team than us away. And well, they, I think that's for sure. Right? <laughs> Comfort level of playing in their own home, uh, their own fans. And I think also they have a different pressure when they play at home, you know, they, for them, it's, you know, maybe not quite life or death, but it's, it's pretty close. You know, and that's, that's, I think, a lot of their out is if they make it to a, a World Cup, that's how they get out of Panama. That's what yeah. they notice. That's, you know, that's going to be their way out or even their bonus. That's, I think Oliver Platt needs to remember as well that, you know, Mexico, which is the best side in, in CONCACAF by far at the moment, in my opinion, uh, for me, a, a, for sure, a top 20 team in the world. Um even they struggle when they go to Panama City. Even they struggle when they go to San Pedro Sula. Even yeah. they have a hard time getting a result in Trinidad. Why is that? That's something that we can't answer. But yeah, we can... I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that Canada should go there and you know roll them over 4-0, but I, I think with the level of players we've got right now, for me, if they're going to places like that and losing or you know in this, uh, in this knockout tournament that they might go into, if they're falling behind heavily in those places, yeah. but for me, the excuse that's wearing a little thinner now that we have, you know, Alfonso Davies at Bayern Munich and Jonathan David and players like that. Yeah, I think I we think, definitely, I think when it, even with Nick's team, I think we definitely should have fared better than you did, but yeah. you know. Yeah. I think, I think with the team that, that John has now, um, I, I don't think we've ever had profile players on a yeah. team, especially when it comes to the offensive side of it. I think where, where they might struggle and if, if they do struggle, it will be in the back line. And I think that's where, uh, you know, you saw against the U.S. in, in the U.S. Where, where they kind of struggled a bit. And now, especially if they're going down to Central American uh, countries and they need to get results. I don't think it'll be because of the offensive players or the, the type of players. It'll be because of the back line. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We had uh, Ian Hume on last week, uh, one of your former teammates, and he had some pretty high praise for you. What, uh, what did, how much of that did you see? And uh, what did you think of all the compliments you were getting from me and him? Yeah, it was, you know, I, and me. I sent, I sent <laughs> and Kurt, fine. And Kurt. That was funny. I sent, but I you're sent, on every day, Larson. <laughs> I sent Ian and uh, Kurt an e-transfer before the meeting. And it was funny. <laughs> Kurt was the only one who accepted it. Oh, man. <laughs> He just said what he thought. No, but I, I have a great relationship with Ian. I, I played with him for the last, God, 15, 15 odd years. We were together in the Under-20 World Cup in, in Dubai. And, and from then, we've been together on, on national team trips. And, you know, he's, he's a great guy. He, he loves football at heart. He loves football just as much as I do. And, and he wants to be around the game as long as he can. And I think that's why he's, he was kind of frustrated at, you know, not being able to come back to his own country, Canada, and be given a shot to, to, you know, help out or play with one of the CPL teams. And I think he, he deserved that shot. You know, I think there was probably a lot of factors that we don't know about that, that kind of hindered that, but, you know, I think he's had a great career. Uh, what he did in India, I think was unbelievable as well, stepping out of the bubble and, and going to do that. And, you know, I think it's just a matter of time before maybe we see him on the coaching side of things in the CPL. So what did you think of that conversation that led to your name being mentioned? I think it was more or less a conversation about, you know, the best 11 players of the last uh, kind of two decades. Um, Underrated a word that was thrown out. Underrated. I mean, I think you were kind of an honorable mention, but it, it has to feel good to be among the Julian de Guzman's, the Paul Stahl Terry's, the Tiba Hutchinson's, and to have your name included in there. Because, I mean, I think you would agree that most Canadians will likely throw Nick Ledgerwood's name into a list of the top Canadian players of the last 20 years. But a lot of them don't realize how many times you answered the phone to, to come in and play for Canada and the, the path that you carved out in Europe. So um, as to put it as a question, I mean, you're, you're kind of in this middle ground where the team now is getting a lot of attention. The team before you came into it was, you know, a gold cup winner. Yeah. It kind of lost in there somewhere. So how do you, how do you feel about your time just kind of being lost in there and, and, and still getting some recognition from, from players? I mean, yeah, it's, it's tough to not, I guess, get the recognition, but on the flip side, get the recognition as like an underrated player and, and be thrown into the conversations. Um, you know, it's exactly how you put it 
I was always kind of in the middle ground of, I never played for any massive clubs in Europe like, you know, a Stalteri or a De Guzman, or I, you know, I never had that final step in my career where I could, could make it uh, to those levels. But I was always, I was always brought in to, to camps. Uh, you know, I played in three World Cup cycles under, I think it was six, five or six different national team coaches. So there, there was always something there where the coaches wanted to bring me back in, um, you know, whether it be my worth at work ethic or you know the ability to to play me in different positions all the time um so i was always available to be brought in um but yeah we never we never accomplished anything great when when i was with the national team you know we never we never did well at a gold cup uh we got damn close to qualifying for the hex but probably had the biggest loss in in canadian history to honduras when it happened yeah. which kind of overshadowed it um, so yeah, it was, it was a bittersweet time with the national team. You know, every time I went on trips, I, I absolutely loved it. You know, it was, it was a different kind of, uh, atmosphere with the guys and, you know, playing along the likes of Atiba, uh, Julian de Guzman, Scott Arfield, uh, you know, was in there. Um, you know, Dwayne de Rosario, uh, Stalteri in the beginning when I, when I was involved with McKenna as well, like those are all memories that, I'll have for the rest of my life. And I absolutely love playing for the Canadian team. Anybody that we didn't put in our uh, kind of all time of the 2000s that you thought deserved to be in there, or was it pretty straightforward? No, it was pretty straightforward. I mean, right, I, give me your honorable mentions. Give me your honorable mentions then. Players that I played with that, you know, for me, Atiba Hutchinson was, was a different class when, when, when he was being involved with the national team. Uh, just not only, not only him as a player, but him as a person and, and a leader. Um, you know, I got to play with Radzinski early on in my career with the national team. And, and he was somebody that had a different, a different touch to him, you know, around the net, even in, in training, his finishing was unbelievable. Um, you know, McKenna, Stalteri, all extremely good leaders when it came to, you know, uh, leading teams. Um, and, and for me at the end of the, at the end of my career at the national team, probably, you know, Scott Arfield, uh, you know, to have him join the Canadian national team and be a part of it. Uh, he got integrated extremely quick. He's a great guy to get along with and a phenomenal footballer. Um, you know, I didn't get the likes really to, to play with Alfonso or, or Jonathan David, but I think now those are the those are the next names that are absolutely blowing people away. Got another question coming in from the chat. This one from Vincent. You mentioned playing under a few different regimes and coaches. Who is your favorite boss of the bunch and why? Favorite boss of the bunch. Whew. You know, for for different reasons, they they all had different things about them. And I, I could say, you know, good things about all of them. Um, Hardy at the, at the beginning, you know, he created an atmosphere when anybody got called into the national team that it was, it was a very fun, uh, enjoyable atmosphere to be there. Uh, you know, everybody loved to go out and train and, and be a part of it. Um, and then on the flip side, I think tactically where maybe Hardy lacked a little bit with, with, with the national team at that time, uh, maybe due to the resources, Benito Flora was tried to be, or he is a, you know, he was a tactical genius in what he tried to implement. He was a perfectionist in, in the little aspects of the game. I remember in the first camp, we would practice throw-ins for hours, like small parts of the game, but to have such a big outcome in games, we're throwing set pieces, dead ball situations, and you know, stuff like that. And then, you know, yeah, but his dead ball, come on, man, his dead ball defending was, was ridiculous. He was the one, didn't he, didn't he want to defend restarts from like the penalty spot or something? Yeah. He had, he had an extremely low line. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, Maybe you are. Yeah. You're going to tell me something like, Oh, we didn't concede any goals. Like that's what, that's what I mean. Everybody laughs about it, but you go back and you try to find a goal where we can see yeah, yeah. low and you didn't. So you know, and that and that's what it was like at times. People, people w wouldn't believe it until it happened. You know, uh, he would he would set up training sessions where people, you know, players would be like, "Why, why are we doing this? Like, we've been taught the exact opposite our whole life, 
<laughs> but then it would work and you'd be like man is this guy a genius or is you know and, and that's what it was like so I think all the coaches I I tried to take positives from all of them and I had you know an unbelievable time being being a part of it so I was a good deep dive on the men's national team. Good stuff. <laughs> thanks for your questions. And, and thanks, Nick, for sharing some insight. Okay, let's have a little bit of fun. Not that we weren't having fun before, but let's let's put footy away for a little bit. This is a new segment that uh, we've come up with called the, rand or the Quarantine Random Roundtable. So it's going to be a bunch of stuff not related to football. We'll go around the horn and just give us your best answer. I mean, obviously think about it, but don't, don't spend more time than you need to because really these are inconsequential questions. Ollie, we'll start with you. Question number one, because I haven't heard from you in a while and I miss your voice. What is the strangest Google search you have made since you started self-isolating? Uh, so I was looking through my history to try and find one and one stood out. Um, I'm not like an avid Simpsons watcher. I watch it now, now and then, but I'm not like in on the jokes and so on. So I was trying to find out the other day if they really do call hamburgers steamed hams in Albany, New York, <laughs> um, which I wasn't aware of as, as, as a Simpsons joke. And turns out it is, and they do not. So yeah, I got my answer there. <laughs> Kurt, strangest search? Uh, I don't have I don't have any strange ones, to be honest. My last one, I was, let me just tell you what my last one was. I was in bed last night after watching a Ozark, and I just wikipedia uh, every member of the cast and looked at their Wikipedia page to figure out who they were. That's that's my that's my last one. So. That. A post-watch Wikipedia. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. that's. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a during show Wikipedia kind of guy. Uh, Larson, are you sure you're not googling how to money launder? Like you don't have to lie to us. We're all friends. Uh, here. Not not, a, not as of yet, but once we get to my uh, my uh, uh, what I wanted to be when I grew up, maybe it'll maybe it'll make a little more sense now. <laughs> We'll see how long this hiatus lasts before we think about alternate career moves. Ledger, what's your strangest one that you can think of? Uh, just one I did the other day was was what rice I needed to make a paella, actually. Mm. And? Don't it's, leave us hanging. Yeah, it's pretty much like a risotto type rice that you need to have simmered on the, on the stove for a while. So I'll let you know how the recipe goes when I finally make it. Excellent. Uh, my strangest, I've been on an F1 binge for a while, um, especially like I was really excited about F1 this year, especially because like I've always been a racing fan without giving you too many boring details about my life, but I'm on an F1 swing right now. Anyways, I was watching the virtual Grand Prix that they were doing yesterday and I ended up getting to a point in my Googling where I said, which F1 drivers pee themselves during races? Because I remembered Lewis Hamilton saying he won't do it. And some guys are like, yeah, I'm in there for three hours and I sweat and it's hot. I could do it all the time. So that's my strangest one. Um, moving on from okay. pee to food. If you could only eat one food for the duration of self-isolation, what would that one food be? Remember, we don't know when this will end. So choose wisely. I'll take this one. Um, so one of the best presents I've received in recent memory was a food processor because now I've learned that I can pretty much chop up anything and throw it in a burrito and the consistency of the burrito just tastes like there's just a bunch of stuff in it, right? So now whenever I make a burrito, I always chop up a head of broccoli and then I also I put that in the burrito as well. You can't even tell you're eating basically raw broccoli in there. So I'm going to go with a burrito. What you put in a burrito as long as you fill it up, put some cheese in it, and then throw hot sauce on it, it just tastes the same no matter what, no matter what's in it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm sure I'd sign up. Yeah. Regardless of what's in there. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, but I have a similar answer. I went for tacos. I use a lot of hot sauce and cheese. <laughs> I've gone for tacos. You get all the food groups. You get different options. So I think that would keep it fairly fresh. I don't agree with you, but I completely agree with your food group. So. I haven't I haven't had like Mexican cuisine since Lloyd and I got back from our trip for the with the women's national team. I've just been afraid to just completely underwhelm myself. Nick, what would you choose? I'm gonna have to stick with with a some kind of pasta. You know, you can mm. throw you can throw a bunch of stuff in there. You can change it up. Uh, you know, I might I might come out of the isolation a little heavier than everybody else, but it had to be it had to be pasta. <laughs> I could probably do a tortellini rosé every day, but for the same reason, I'm not going to choose that and say stir fry because you can have a lot of fun and and have a lot of different flavors in the same meal. Uh, guilty pleasure binge watch since we started self quarantine. Mine was catching up on. It's a terrible, terrible show, but I just can't stop watching it. Yeah, Nick, I, do you want to take the or yeah. Dolly? I guess we'll stick it same order. It doesn't matter. 
there's no rules. Nick, go ahead. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, you know, for me, it's almost like once 8.30 comes around and the kids are in bed, it's just find yourself on the couch and see what comes up. Um, I have to admit, I did cruise through Tiger Kings. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what a terribly great show that is. Train wreck. Oh, terrible. Um, but right now, I'm just watching Sunderland Till I Die, the, the second yeah. So that's what I'm into right now. I usually try to knock off one or two episodes a night. Mm-hmm. Anyone else watching? So I, I finished it, I think, last night. What um, What about you guys? Have you seen the second season? I haven't seen the second season, though. I enjoyed the first one, though. Yeah, it, they seen. still they're still getting throttled. So it's like it kind of <laughs> I got to a point in the season where I'm like, OK, I just want to finish it. But yeah. 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 Uh, what are you binging? Or, oh, guilt, sorry. No, no. What are you binging? We know what you're binging. Ozark. You mentioned no, that earlier. Binging, yeah, yeah we, we but what's your guilty pleasure? pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Love Island. I've already said it. I've already said it on a bunch of shows. Love Island. Love it. Uh, wouldn't want to be involved in it, but uh, watching it from afar, it's great. Yeah, mine um, preceded the quarantine, but every Sunday night is 90 Day Fiance in, in our apartment. <laughs> you know what? I, I have to admit, I, I watch 90 Day Fiance. It's terrible. It, yeah. it's, it's terrible, but captivating. Yeah, it's it's like a it's like a it's like a car accident. You know, you can't turn away. <laughs> I think it says a lot about us as human beings that we use. Usually, we don't have as much free time as we do right now. But people love train wreck television so much that we're willing to like. We have maybe two hours of free time a day. We're just gonna waste it on. I love Island. All this stuff, good stuff. Because it makes you feel train better track. about yourself. It makes you feel better about your own life. It's pathetic. That's, it makes you feel normal, does it? Okay, yeah. fair enough. Um, and have you ever been on a blind date? This one came up on the queue. And if you have, tell us about it. That was from producer Kyle. I haven't, so I have no input here. No, I mean, either. I'm afraid. Any I good have never blind been, date I have actually never been on a blind date. Probably should have asked everyone beforehand. I, yeah. I went, I, I wouldn't consider it a blind date. I got, when I first moved to Germany, uh, one of the teammates set me up with, with a girl for a date and just because I couldn't speak any any German at the time he he set me up with a girl who said you know her English was quite good so I met her at a coffee shop and she didn't speak a lick of English <laughs> just probably the most awkward half an hour not probably not even a half an hour because I think we just got up and you know parted ways probably the most painful 20 that sounds like a little teammate hazing initiation kind of thing to me (laughs) i also i just feel like if you're on a blind date uh and and now i'm happily married um but before that i never had to go on a blind date because i think you know blind dates are for people who are having a hard time meeting people right so uh as long as you're a, a reasonable easily liked like uh myself and apparently oliver platt you don't have to go on blind dates what was her name, Nick? Do you remember? Oh, I have no idea. Yeah, I was <laughs> so not even memorable in that uh, sense. I was, I was 19 at the time. That's that's way too far in my past. <laughs> that was a li- that was a little while ago. Um, we we saw a picture that um, earlier. Oh, beautiful picture. Nick Ledgerwood. Is that the most embarrassing hairstyle, or have you had worse? No, that's got to be up there. That definitely has to be up there. Uh, my my phase of going with long hair and a headband. Yeah. You look, you look, what, you look what do like you call you were, that look? look? Well, lost. You looked like you were. In, you looked like you were. Uh, what's that band? Hanson. Yeah. You looked like you were one of the Hanson brothers. I probably could have fit in pretty well with them. But yeah, that was uh, that was the lost days of of just growing out the hockey flow. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. I don't, I don't think that's embarrassing. So when I were we're telling haircut stories. I can move on to my own haircut. So. Uh, believe it or not, I had a worse haircut than Nick Leisurewood did in that picture. And if you haven't looked at it, you should go and look at One Soccer's Twitter handle right now because that's where the picture is available. But when I was that age, I actually took it a step further and had a full perm. So I had curly hair. I got curly. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Nice. I can't see can Oliver. I can't see up? Oliver taking chances. I can't see Oliver taking chances like that. What wow. are you trying to say, Larson? He's not. A, he's, he's a. He's a clean cut guy. When I was like 13, I had the kind of blonde highlights through it, but they kind of just oh, came out. frosted as, tips? Well, they, they started like that, but they came out as kind of just like spots, you know? Yeah, so that, that would probably have to be mine. This is, I did the hockey like diet for the playoffs when we said it was dying blonde, but it was just like 
electric yellow. It was all like, I looked like this color of SpongeBob. That wasn't a good one. And then for a while in high school, I just wouldn't get haircuts for some reason. So it was like even poofier than this. And it was, it was a no go. Um, oh, we only have a couple left here. What, um, we have a lot of time now to reflect on what we want to do once we're able to leave isolation and quarantine, which brings me to a bucket list question. Uh, what is the number one thing on your bucket list and maybe something that is, maybe you've been prompted by all this time in your house that you really want to get out there and achieve it? Hmm. Um, I want to go to Japan. That's been mine for a while now. Okay. Not really any particular reason. I just like to visit Japan. Good stuff. I've been lucky so enough to experience wait. I've been lucky enough to experience a lot of things in my life. Climb Kilimanjaro two years ago with my wife. So that was pretty good. I've walked with penguins in Patagonia. I've climbed glaciers, been all, been all over the place. But I think if I could choose to do one thing, it would be to uh, go to Mount Everest base camp and just kind of be there at the base of Mount Everest. It's a nice hike and beautiful scenery. Probably... Probably skydive. Oh, mm. I can't imagine it. Terrible. It sounds terrible. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a thing on the bucket list that I'd, I'd like to cross off. Yeah. Skydiving. Skydiving. Skydiving's in the top five. For, I bungee jumped when I was 13 in BC, and then skydiving was always the next step. Haven't got there yet, but I'm. my bucket list is I want to finish my pilot training, get my private pilot's license, and I want to land on every continent except for Antarctica, unless I can find a sweet snow or ice runway. Um, but I think I want to be able to fly the plane before I think about jumping out of the plane, Nick. But I'm with you. Skydiving's up there. Okay, only a couple of minutes left. So one last question. What is your dream job? If from, <laughs> and obviously, Nick, you have a pretty good one being a professional athlete. But if you had to say now at this point in your life, if you had to pick another dream job, what would it be? Um, another dream job would be playing on the PGA Tour, playing golf. Yes. You know, you never see it a golfer playing bad cold weather or in, in a crappy location. It's beautiful out. You can, you can play until you're 65, 70 senior PGA after that. So, you know, nobody's stopping you from having a beer on the course. Yep. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I like that a lot. Kurt, you're smiling. What's your other dream job? As much as uh, you love running one soccer or the, the content side of one soccer. Yeah, it's because I don't really even know if it's a job. It's kind of like just be uh, an inheritor of a massive estate where I just uh, kind of just <laughs> do do philanthropy and kind of do stuff a couple of times a week. Uh, I liken it to the guy in Monopoly, the greedy lender who has the the money bags and, and just being... Uh, that kind of guy who uh, just inherited a lot of cash. So your dream job is to be born rich. Yes. <laughs> okay. Just wanted to what's make wrong? sure what? I got that All right. straight. So, I mean, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? You just you could you could still be a venture capitalist. No, it's because I'm so giving, Adam, that I would be giving a very high percentage oh, of that away and back I to see. the community. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that was definitely that was in my head for sure. Ollie, what's your dream job? <laughs> um, Kind of going along the same lines of not really wanting to do a whole lot. So I, I would quite like to be one of those opinion columnists who doesn't really do any work or like journalism or anything like that, but just kind of right. says, gives their opinion once a week, uh, one column, nice salary. That, that would be pretty good, I think. Pissing off Platt coming to One Soccer <laughs> shortly. If we ever get to a website where we can write features, then maybe we'll see some opinions. Well, yeah. one, col one column and a nice one column and a nice salary. I love that answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> People in the New York Times, they, they've got that sorted. So. I already did that. I already did that at the Toronto Sun. It wasn't that great. But you actually had to be a reporter as well. I'm, I'm literally talking about <laughs> staying at home, saying just whatever comes to my head, and then putting it out in print. Good stuff. I mean, I, okay. I love my, I'm totally going to take this opportunity to kiss up to my boss and everyone else watching, but I've got the dream job right now. I mean, I want to, I want to cover a world cup. I want to call a world cup. I want to host games around a world cup and be a part of that atmosphere. Um, but other than that, I mean, fly planes for fun and do this for, for work. And that's, that's sort of all that I love to do. That's going to wrap it up for us. That was 59 minutes. So we have to say goodbye now, Nick, 
thank you so very much for hanging out with us today. Great to catch up with you, see what's going on. And I mean, we're all trying to get through this quarantine together, but we appreciate you coming on. Uh, we're going to continue to roll along the content tomorrow. Asa is back on the Hangouts. Paul Stalteri, another former Canadian men's international, will join the program. Also, York Nine's new first assistant coach. And then it's Inside the Game with Gareth Wheeler at 7 p.m., where he'll be speaking to John Herdman. So if you haven't already, look down, like that, kick that, head that, whatever you got to do, hit that subscribe button, like the video, share it with a friend, ring the bell if you want to get notified when we go live. We'll talk to you really soon. For Nick, for Kurt, for Ollie, I've been out of the Stay sane and stay safe.